welcome to our second episode of the Rugby Bricks podcast. Today we're joined by a man that um, I've had the privilege of watching play rugby uh, the past few years, covering the Super Sport Rugby Challenge. And then, of course, he's uh, really made his mark for the Bulls over the last two years. Chris Smith, it's great to have you uh, here with us on the Rugby Bricks podcast today. Thanks so much for taking the time. Yeah, cheers, Gary. Thanks very much for having me. Chris, maybe we can just start off with uh, where you guys are at. It's a, it's another preseason. It's been a pretty interesting 12 months of rugby. How are you feeling after the, you know, the season you just went through with uh, Super Rugby and then a very short kickoff series and, and the short break into what is going to be pretty new territory for all South African rugby players? Yeah, so we had a relatively short break um, after the Curry Cup final. Um, came back, um, and you know, now we're straight into a, into a preseason, preparing for the Rainbow Cup. Um, obviously, yeah, potentially a different style of rugby playing in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so, yeah, a lot of detail we're trying to get through, um, a lot of different things that we're hopefully going to try out against those Northern Hemisphere sides. Um, but otherwise, yeah, sort of preparation is going really well so far, and that yeah, was going to be an awesome challenge to, to tackle those sides. Just before we, you know, chat about your your career at the Bulls and, and your move there a couple of years ago, I wanted to take it back um, where you grew up, where you went to junior school, um, when you first picked up a rugby ball, when you first started playing the sport, and if it was even your, you know, your first choice sport, because I understand your brother is a SA under 19 cricket captain, so you guys are clearly a very gifted sporting family. Yeah, I hope you don't skip any details, but um, yeah, originally from Cape Town, um, born and bred there, um, went to Redham House Junior School. Yeah, I started playing rugby, I think, in grade two um, mm-hmm. as a prop. So, yeah, it was an interesting start to the career, but yeah, I started in grade two, um, played all my sort of junior school rugby at Redham. And then um, making my decision going to high school, obviously wanted to take my sport a bit further and take it a bit more seriously. So, you know, decided to to go to Saks. I thought it was the perfect fit for me. Um, yeah, so I was at Saks from 2008 to, to 2012. Um, yeah, I really yeah, I love Saks, oldest in the proudest school in the country. So, yeah, it was great, great times there. Um, yeah, I played played a lot of cricket, um, a lot of rugby. Um, really enjoyed my cricket. Um, but yeah, I ended up ended up taking the rugby route. Not that I was any good at cricket, but <laughs> which I still still enjoyed it quite a bit. Yeah, I didn't play academy week or, or Craven week at all. Um, so yeah, I didn't have much interest um, for rugby after school, but but really was was keen to to really give it a bash. I got a chance at UCT Trojans. Mm-hmm. For under 20, trained there for but didn't you know, didn't get into the, to the study that I wanted to get into. Um, and yeah, I was sort of left in no man's land. So ended up installing um, air cons for I heard about to make that. a bit of money on the side. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I installed air cons for about a month, um, got paid weekly. Were you pretty good then, at it? <laughs> I mean, yeah, they, they were paying me good money. So I think I must have been doing a good job. <laughs> um, and then some of an opportunity uh, to train with the Vodacom Cup side. Um, my school coach, yeah, I had a connection, so he helped me out there. Um, trained a bit of voties there with, I think, John Dobson was a coach at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the current Western Province with coaching staff. And, yeah, they, they obviously gave me an opportunity there. And then and then Dobbo really helped me to get into the Western Province Rugby Institute. Um, so, yeah, I ended up joining the Western Province Rugby Institute, I think, maybe quite late in April. Mm-hmm. Um, so, sort of just just missed the preseason there. And I know the preseason there at that institute is extremely tough. And then, yeah, so I went there in, in 2013. Yeah, I had a, had a tough day, a tough year there. Um, I think our Western Province on the 19th side, we ended like fifth in the competition. Yeah, it wasn't, wasn't too good. And yeah, I know a lot of the guys didn't get contracted after that. We le- left me in a position where I think I, the best decision was to, to go study. And yeah, so I ended up going to Marty's. I was there for from 2014 to 2018. Um, it was yeah, quite a long journey there. Yeah, I started in 2014, sat sat on the bench. Rob Dupree actually in 2014 had a stint at Marty's and was absolutely on fire. Yeah, I think he was the player of the player of the tournament. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was only fair that I, I sat on the bench for him, <laughs> sat a few 80s, watched him watched him dominate. But 2015 I was injured most of the year, um, and then 2016 started to play a bit more and, and really only got my my proper gap in 2018 under Coach Harvey's um, and ended up winning the competition. What sort of headspace were you in, you know, going out of matric, having not played Craven Week or anything like that? W- were you fairly serious about your rugby before you, you know, got the opportunities that came your way? I mean, d- did you know that you kind of wanted to be a professional or was it only the later parts of your your Marty's career where you're like, damn, I, I can actually do this? Thank you. You obviously leave school. I mean, a lot of, of schoolboys are dreaming to, you know, play rugby professionally and to play rugby as a career. But I think after not playing Academy or Craven Week and not, not having, you know, any interest from, from provinces, sort of left in, left in the dark a bit and, you know, I had to sort of reassess my decision if I really want to take it seriously. The study route was the only way for me. 
Um, but yeah, unfortunately, didn't get into UCT and then luckily got that gap at the Institute, which was obviously, you know, they try to expose you to a, a professional environment and professional training uh, schedules and you know, professional coaches, professional training. And, and then obviously playing against all the, the other provincial under 19 players in the country. So you, you're technically testing yourself against the, the best under 19s in the country because our team didn't do so well. Not many guys were contracted and then oh, I had yeah. to you know, reassess my decision again and think, okay, no, now I'm going to, you know, complete a degree. Um, yeah, I got into Marty's and then luckily, obviously, Varsity Cup is a great stepping stone and a great competition to play in. Got the opportunity there and very blessed that that was, that was the case and that was the journey that I took. I want to move it on to, you know, your two years spent at the Pumas. Um, I happen to literally write the script for the Super Sport Rugby Challenge review show every week. So, I mean, yeah. I was watching all the games. I was watching all the highlights. So, like I said earlier, you know, I, I got to watch you actually play a lot of rugby before you stepped into, yeah. you know, you know, the major spotlight. Um, can you tell me how the move to the Pumas came about, what it was like working with Jimmy Stonehouse and, and you know, at the Pumas? Because I think they really take their conditioning and that sort of thing very seriously. <laughs> yeah, so 2018, we had a really strong Marty side. Um, we ended up winning the competition and I think that sort of put me in a, I don't know, I said, I guess my teammates helped me to to get interest from, from say, provinces. And um, I think Coach Brent, who was in charge of the Pumas at the time yeah, in 2018, time, right. he, actually con- he actually contacted Coach Harvey's. Um, they were looking for a 10. I had a, a really good mate, uh, Ryan Nell, Whitey Nell, mm-hmm. not playing in America, but he was also there. So I think he also helped them put my name forward. Um, so <laughs> there are a few guys playing their, playing their roles. Um, and then, yeah, I managed to sign a, a two-year deal with the Pumas, um, sort of a month into the Varsity Cup of 2018, which was which was awesome because that was sort of the I wouldn't say the confirmation, but sort of the boost I needed that you know maybe I can actually you know give professional rugby a go. Right after the 2018 Varsity Cup final, I was on a plane to Nelspruit that next morning. Arrived there sort of late afternoon. Was meant to just sit on the side and watch, um, and there goes Jimmy comes walking over and says, "Grace, you in?" <laughs> um, so I tried to stand to the deep end, sort of had a bit of a bubble out, and so now I've got to train with these, you know, these professional rugby players. So that was, yeah, um, so chucked into the deep end and then ended up actually playing that weekend against the Bulls um, at an Red Rugby Club, starting pretty, pretty surreal. We gave the Bulls quite a hiding, so it was a good start. And then, yeah, working with Coach Brent that first, that first part of the year, which was, which was really great. Loved working with him. Um, yeah, it really sort of sort of stimulated me and sort of I really enjoyed um, his sort of outlook on rugby and his attention to detail and, and all of that, which was which was great. Yeah, then Coach Jimmy, Coach Jimmy took over to I think the end of 2018, um, 2019 season. He believes in hard work and and best believe we we grafted there at, at the Pumas. Um pre-seasons there, pre-seasons there were long, uh, long and tough. Um, but yeah, I really like loved my time with the Pumas and you know I wouldn't change wouldn't change it for the world. It molded me into the the player, the player I was, and obviously put me in good, good stead going, going to the Bulls. And your performances, I mean, spoke for themselves because you were the top point scorer, I think, in 2018. 18, and yeah, you know, yeah and, and I guess all of that kind of just all roads led to Loftus after that. Can you chat a little bit about how the the move to 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 Loftus came about as well? And because that must have been pretty exciting. Uh, if you were excited about a contract with the Pumas, I'm sure when the Bulls put that uh, contract down in front of you, that must have been very cool. So 2018 had a, had a really good year. Um, then 2019, Super Sport Challenge was also good again. I went on loan in beginning of 2019 to the Bulls for for about a seven week period to cover for Marnie and, and, and Polly, and you know to get exposed to that sort of you know bigger union and the way they did things and was was bloody awesome. But after those seven weeks, went back, played a bit in the Curry Cup and whatnot, and then yeah, Coach Coach Porter, I think at the time the director was Alphonse Mayer. They you know, they showed interest and they and they wanted me to to join the Bulls and that's obviously what you work towards. No offense to the Pumas, but but yeah, you obviously want to be part of a big union and you know really stepping stepping up and working with the big dogs. I guess. I guess we can just jump into to what it's been like at the at the Bulls. Um, the last six months, you guys have won everything that there is to win. You were there while Coach Puerto was in charge, and then now Jake White is in charge. What's the difference between the two coaches, and and what's it like working with Jake White? I mean, he's a Rugby World Cup winning. Springbok coach. I'm not going to compare the two. I'm just going to talk about <laughs> Coach Jake and, and him taking over. Okay. Um, but John, no, he's he's really been great for the union. You know, he's really re- created a great environment, a great culture. He obviously brought world class players um, to the Bulls. Yeah, sort of turned it into really sort of a high performance unit, and I think that's made all the difference. Um, his attention to detail is is incredible. And, yeah, he's put together a great coaching staff, and you know, Coach Chris, that I worked with. 
at Martin in 2014. So we've come a long way. Coach Jordan, Coach Joey, Coach Kaz, Coach Nollis. I'm not missing anyone out. But yeah, so his coaching staff is really incredible. Um, great men. And yeah, so that sort of unit has, has really helped uh, mold the Bulls into the, yeah, the team we are at the moment. Well, you've got Jake White as the coach. And some people would say you're the understudy to, to Mornay Stain, but I don't think that's really fair. I think you guys have shared the, the fly-off duties um, quite well over the past six months to a year. Um, how much have you, you learned from Mornay Stain? I mean, he, he really is. If you, if you look at his stats and stuff, he's one of the best fly-offs you know, South Africa has seen for a long time. <laughs> if you said understudy to Mornay Stain, I'd probably take it. But <laughs> um, yeah, it's been absolutely incredible. <laughs> Incredible working with him. He's a you know he's a legend on and off the field. Um, you know I observe him daily. I watch him. You know everything he does. Watch where he strikes the ball. I you know, he probably gets a bit irritated when I'm on his case most of them, asking him questions 24/7. Um, but yeah, he's been really helpful. And I think he obviously want to get into that number one role. You know I had to uh, and and try and see if I could actually compete with him. You know what I mean? So. That, that has probably helped on its own. Um, you know, to have him as a mentor has been incredible. I'm probably one of the, the luckier clubs in, in South Africa to have a mentor like Mornay Stain. Um, so, no, it's been awesome. And we are yeah, really good friends off the field. And, yeah, what a legend. Kicking sessions with Mornay. Now, I mean, I know uh, a lot of people have, have spoken at length how, you know, Mornay, you know, taught himself to kick and really worked hard on his game. And, you know, there's photos of him with the tennis ball, like, you know, keeping his, yeah. to try and keep his head down. Has he tried to make you do that? And what are those kicking sessions like? Because, I mean, he really is one of the best strikers of the ball. No, well, I mean, he's been he's been doing it for so long. He's, he's kicking he's like a robot. <laughs> um, the same when we, when we kick to each other across the field, I'm chasing him left to right and, just kicking to me standing still so <laughs> no, he's, he's still he's definitely still got it but uh, yeah we had a little a little joke with each other the other day and he you know he said if he had to if he had to give away all his secrets then he'd be without a job so he's gonna hold on to most of his secrets for now and until his career is over that's pretty good um speaking of kicking I, I wanted to chat to you a little bit about that i mean obviously rugby bricks does a lot of coaching pete does a lot of focus on detail and on goal kicking in particular when did you start kicking if there was someone in particular that taught you how to kick who was it and and how much have, has your kicking style changed over the years as a youngster you end up kicking off just those plain cones and um, mm -hmm. sort of that's how it started I, you know, I probably started kicking in grade five started in one of those flat cones even to get more distance i bought one of those cone you know cut the top so ball at an angle like that just to get more distance mm -hmm. um and then I think grade eight, grade nine, still, you know, I kicked off one of those adjustable tees. Um, and I kicked off before the, the vortex. Um, and then I think in, in, in grade 11, I actually kicked off the, the super tee that Dan Carter kicks off, that extremely flat one. Yeah. Um, which I, I had quite good success with that. And then in matric, I kicked off the Gilbert one that Mornay kicks with at the moment. In 20, end of 2014, I actually broke, I broke my left ankle um, and sort of resulted in me in my plant foot Sort of not being in the right position um, to kick off those flat tees anymore so so i went to the the adjustable tee yeah and then i i sort of obviously then i sort of knew a little bit about kicking um and i was always always struggling to find a tee that sort of you know with the with the adjustable tee your balls you know it's not always in the same position um obviously because of the, the adjusting and whatnot and often didn't sit nicely and, and all of that and so then i was obviously looking for a tee that was sort of in a you know a, a standard a standard position that wasn't going to move and then I tried that that super tee that some of the guys are now the sort of a thin base yeah, with the little the... thing at the top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I tried that, but that was that was that was too low for me. So I kept it in the ground. Then I went back to the adjustable <laughs> those red adjustable tees. Yeah. Um. And then and then obviously luckily these this baby. Yeah. And this yeah you're obviously looking for a tee that's gonna you know be the perfect height. It's gonna offer little resistance. It's gonna be light. It's you know the ball's gonna sit comfortably and. Yeah, so I've been obviously really, really stoked with the with this vortex mode cut. It's been awesome yeah. to, to kick off at the moment. It's been nice to hear you talk about that because, I mean, I remember being a kid, literally, same thing, kicking off the cones when I started. But whenever I tried to kick off those harder tees, yeah. you know, half a, a, a fraction of your foot is actually catching the tee and stuff. And that always used to bother me. And, like, until I tried a tee like 100%. this, I, yes, I always exactly. had that problem. It was either too low yeah. Or what I was using was like too hard, and it was just it wasn't it wasn't right. So um, and I was just saying what you're saying that the hitting a tee and, and all of that is that I actually used to find that it used to actually ruin my boots a lot quicker than uh, standard. So often on my on my right kicking foot, you know, where I strike the ball and obviously the cone at the same time, it was actually damaging my boot quite. quite yeah, it, so it, it bad boy has been 
Yeah, no, no problem. Just, just go. We're gonna have to send you a lot more. <laughs> um, okay, so we've kind of <laughs> we've kind of touched on your kicking, but um, I wanted to take you back to to the Curry Cup final because I mean, obviously that was a I, I mean the Curry Cup final now. Wow. Kerwin missed quite a few kicks, and then you missed the kick right at the end. What was going through your mind? How much pressure was there? Because I mean, obviously there was more than meets the eye going on in that game because both you and Kerwin had been kicking almost flawlessly through the season. I'm being very honest here. Um, but, you know, in that game, finals rugby, I guess it's just a little bit more pressure than, than you might think. Yeah, so, yeah, so, I mean, I think I came on with about six minutes to go. Um, honestly, didn't think I was going to get into the park. Obviously, it was, you know, it was a tight game. So, normally, normally you, leave, you, know, you leave your fly on and you leave your, you leave your kicker. Um, so, when I went on, I was pretty surprised. And then, you know, we got a penalty sort of a few minutes while I was on the field and luckily it was right in front. So that was sort of a, ner a nerve settler. Um, yeah, so I put that one over um, and then, yeah, then went yeah, went down to that last kick um, on the buzzer. I, ca I can't actually tell you what I was thinking at the time, but I sort of, when that penalty, like I knew that, I knew the moment was coming. I knew that big moment was coming. And so I think even before that penalty had come, I was sort of, while the game was sort of going and I was trying to get my mind into the, you know, into the right zone. Mm. Um, and then that, penalty came um, I sort of as that penalty as they blew the whistle I sort of walked back and walked back like 10 meters and then turned around and, and came back to where the penalty spot was just to see try clear my mind and whatnot but I think you know in a moment like that you, you just hope that the doubt doesn't creep in um, and, and you sort of you sort of you know I had a few kicks on on the buzzer there at, against Providence against the Cheetahs which I also missed but you sort of you think okay I need to go back to my process um, I'm gonna slow things down because normally in a moment like that because you're trying not to think you know, you suddenly speed things up and, and obviously that messes with your process. So yeah, I sort of, you know, thought, okay, listen, this is this is my time. This is my moment. Um, <laughs> this is going to make me. Um, and yeah, I sort of, you know, addressed the kick and yeah, I unfortunately you know, pulled it to the left. But I did, I sort of felt like I did everything that I could, stuck to my process, kept my head down longer than usual. But I guess it just wasn't meant to be. And yeah, I went to the left and yeah, thank goodness to, to Adrian Berta for, for scoring an extra time. <laughs> it's yeah. very interesting to hear your, you know, your take on that because I can imagine for a few days you're probably thinking the moment over and over and over again in your head. And I, I don't know, in, in your mind, is there is there a lot that you can do or, or do you just walk away from it thinking, hey, I've, it is what it is. I've, I've learned what I've learned and, and you can only try again next time. So on exactly, exactly on that and, and that's, and like you say, so I obviously missed the kick to the left, but but the funny thing is, is that in in captain's run, I sort of only start in the front on the ten meter, have a few strikes, have a few strikes, and then I go to the left, have a few strikes, have a few strikes, and then I don't often go to that right hand side, and that's obviously where the kick was from. Then then I normally leave that right hand side for match day. So then I start in the middle, and then I go to the right hand side and have my kicks from the right. Best believe the kick to win the Curry Cup final is on that right hand side, a <laughs> side that I hadn't put as much time into as you know the left hand side or in front of the pole. So I guess yeah, probably my mistake. So lesson learned there. Yeah. If someone's filming at Loftus while you're kicking, they're gonna there's gonna be a lot of footage of you kicking on the right hand side of the field then. <laughs> yeah, you say that after every kick, kicking session now, I always go to that exact spot, kick on, just to make sure that I can, you know. Yeah. Put the baby over. I think we, we've chatted as much as we can about uh, kicking. I did want to quickly ask you, I mean, how often are you and Mornay doing a kicking session together or, or how often are you doing individual work on your, your goal kicking and kicking out of hand, I guess? So we actually we actually do every day, you know, on a, on a Monday after our team session, I was here, Mornay, Chris, Chris, starting to ask me where I'm at. And then we, yeah, we kick out of hand to each other for, for about 10 minutes. And then, yeah, then we go and have a few strikes at poles. Yeah, sort of on a Monday, we just start in the middle, just work on rhythm get a few strikes in um, on a Tuesday. Also start again out of hand uh, for about 10 minutes. And then we also start in the middle again, but we, you know, we work, then we work to the 15s, focus on a few penalties. Um, and then on our the Wednesday off, then on our Thursday, on our on our tempo day, um, yeah, then we also start again in the middle, but then we sort of focus a bit more on conversions and just to try to cover sort of everything throughout the week. But yeah, we kick, we kick daily and yeah. Try to get as much kicking in as possible. I don't think you'll ever kick enough. It really is a muscle memory movement. So the, the more you're doing it, the better. Okay. Chris, I, I just want to look forward to, you know, the season that's coming. Uh, it's very weird to, you know, 
Well, I guess everything is finally going back into proper order because we're about to go into winter when you should really be, you know, playing rugby. Um, the move up north, how are you feeling about that? You know, are you excited to face different teams? What's the general mood from from players looking at a, a completely changed rugby calendar for South African teams? I think you can imagine a lot of the guys are excited. I know, I'm sure a lot of the guys are going to definitely miss Super Rugby. Um, but obviously, there's a new challenge ahead. Northern Hemisphere rugby is, is probably you know, a bit tighter. A um, lot of focus on a, on a good kicking game. Um, and I think the Northern Hemisphere sides are, the attention to detail is, is absolutely incredible. You see, our coach Jake always compares, compares to Leinster. Um, I mean, they, their side has probably been together for, you know, five years. Some of the guys are sitting on 100 caps, 150 caps. So now you're up against, you know, an experienced side as well. Um, so I think it's going to be a massive challenge. Um, but obviously you always want to, you know, you always want to challenge yourself. So I think the guys are excited for the challenge. You know, I think to play rugby in the Northern Hemisphere, it's, it's definitely going to be tough. Obviously the, the conditions sometimes don't allow for sort of running game that we like to play yeah, in South Africa. And yeah, I think it's going to be tough to play in that ice cold weather. Just looking at that in terms of, of game, game play, I mean, obviously you can't, you can't give away too much about how you guys want to play. Yeah. But I mean, like you say, the conditions are probably going to force things a little bit tighter and maybe a little bit more kicking. I mean, that'll suit you and Mornay uh, pretty well. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, you're always you know, striving to put together the, 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 perfect, the perfect game. I mean, a, a game between sort of you know, running and kicking. Yeah, you know, like I said, not trying to give too much away, but you know, obviously we're going to focus a lot on our, on our kicking game. Um, so that's really sound. I think a bit of running maybe here and there. So <laughs> I think playing up there, you'll, you know, obviously, it's gonna, like you said, it's going to be a lot tighter. The forwards are going to have to front up. Uh, but hopefully if those sides come down here, Hopefully in the summer, in the summer months where the, where the, the Pretoria sun is baking, um, we'll be able to chase them around the park. Just lastly, I mean, have you have you thought further ahead of, of your career? I mean, obviously every South African rugby player, you know, wants to put on that Springbok jersey. Are you, are you a process-driven type player? You're like, I'm not really thinking about that. Or, you know, is it something like, damn, I'm, that's the goal that I'm working towards. If it takes five years, I'm going to get there. I mean, you've already showed a lot of resilience to to follow the path that you followed, I guess. So I just thought about this in the car on the way on the way back from training, I thought maybe this question would come up. Um, yeah, I think realistically, you know, if I had to look, think picking order, I'm 100th or whatnot. But so I think probably at the moment, I'm, you know, chasing my sort of my own standards, my own goals, trying to become the best sort of player that I can be. I mean, I'm obviously not even first choice of the Bulls yet. So thinking, thinking that far ahead probably would you know, it's a bit, probably a bit stupid. Um, but I, yeah, I think, you know, setting my own goals, setting my own standards. Um, yeah, I'm sort of at an age where I, you know, I just want to enjoy my rugby. Yeah, and sort of make the most of it. Obviously, a rugby career is, is really short-lived, so I think enjoying, enjoying this journey and enjoying this sort of this career is probably number one. Just on the side, what did you finish studying at Marty's and, and have you thought about what it is that you would do after rugby? Is anything you, you kind of Yeah, so in? I finished with a, finished with a BCom honours in public development management. Um, did it through the business school there in Stelly's. And to be fair, I haven't thought about what I'm going to do after rugby, but you know, I've obviously spoken to a lot of, a lot of sort of older players, a lot of maybe ex-players, um, thinking, you know, do I start now or, you know, whatnot? Because I, I often do, you know, you know, feel the pressure thinking, you know, I need to have something on the side. I need to, you know, sort myself out uh, for after rugby. I do, well, I do have this little frame. I'm going to advertise a bit. I do have a little framing, a jersey framing business on the side that I do Get for in. fun to frame. frame I need to jerseys, frame is... some jerseys. So I'm going to, I'm going to drop, drop yeah, your please, DM after this. <laughs> Jed Smith framing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, obviously I do that on the side just for fun. But I think thinking bigger picture, the moment I got nothing, um, but a lot of my sort of the people that I have spoken to, they said, you know, don't put yourself under too much pressure. You know, it will, it will happen on its own. I think obviously with my rugby goals at the moment, I'm sort of probably 80, 90 percent, 95 percent focused on the rugby, and you know that five percent outside of after after rugby life will will hopefully get bigger, and I'll look at that in a sort of a, the nearer future. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about that too much. I think you've got too much going for you on the rugby field to be to be worrying about that anytime soon. But I think we're gonna we're gonna leave it at that. Um, thanks very much for chatting to me. It's been really good to kind of just pick your brain about how you approach the game. It's been really great to see your your development and you know see you step up to a top union like the Bulls and and really really play well. The Rugby Bricks team is behind you, um, and we're really really excited to see you play well this season and and for the rest of your career.